Hi, I'm Joanne Dish, and I'm a clinical professor of nursing at the University of Minnesota. I've been a nurse for decades, and I would choose it again tomorrow. Um, and as many of you know, nursing is very much in the public side today. All of healthcare is. And so our dean, Connie Delaney, I thought it would be very informative to have a brief video on contemporary nursing today. Because for those of you who might be working in a school of nursing or working with nurses or have nurses within your organization, it's important to understand uh, what nursing is today, maybe disabuse you of some of the myths of nursing today, and then talk a little bit about some of the challenges. So this brief video is going to hopefully cover all of that. Probably all of you have heard of Florence Nightingale, also called the Lady with the Lamp. She was born in 1820, lived 100 years till 1920, but most famous for the role that she played in the Crimean War. What was apparent at the time is that more people were dying from infectious diseases rather than from battle wounds, and she thought there's got to be a better way. So what she did was embark upon a series of practices to increase the cleanliness of the care that was being provided. And she really revolutionized the care of the sick that was offered at that day. So she is incredibly well known and often called the mother of nursing. However, we need to think about maybe Florence as the mother of Western nursing because for thousands of years there have been people who played the role of a nurse, who took care of the sick who helped those with terrible symptoms, who helped people transition into death or into childbirth. So uh, if we look back a thousand years or two, about 100 BC, the Sharaka Samhita was written in India stating that good medical practice requires a patient, physician, nurse, and medicines. And the nurse was expected to be knowledgeable, skilled at preparing formulations, and sympathetic towards everyone, and clean. Those were the expectations. In 50 AD, the first known Christian nurse, Phoebe, was mentioned in one of the biblical texts. During the early years of the Christian church, St. Paul sent a deaconess named Phoebe to Rome as the first visiting nurse. And then in 620, we have the first recorded Muslim nurse. And so nursing has been around for thousands of years. And so I think it's better to say that Florence Nightingale is the mother of Western nursing and that to acknowledge that there have been nurses for forever. One of my favorite small texts talks about witches, midwives, and nurses. And the point that was made was that many of the women and men that were burned at this stake in the Middle Ages were more likely healers. Many said that they were nurses, and they were burned at the stake for terrible things, such as curing people from pain, applying poultices so that they wouldn't have sores that were incredibly painful, in helping them have a healthy digestive tract. And so these terrible things that these people were doing, nursing, and helping people be more comfortable, they thought were attributable to special powers. And so they were burned at the stake as witches. The word nurse actually originates from the Latin word nutrire, meaning to suckle, referring to a wet nurse. For centuries, mostly women within religious or military systems cared for the sick. Now today, it's greatly expanded. Nurses protect, promote, and restore healthy well-being. They prevent illness and injury. They alleviate suffering. They help people in times of trans transition, whether it be at birth or at death. We use what we call the nursing lens. Uh, nurses, for the most part, look at the world in a particular way. And whether you're practicing on the East Coast, the West Coast, in France, in South America, uh, nurses, for the most part, uh, have a very holistic view of the world. They are systems-oriented. Uh, they can see the big picture. Uh, they're relationship-based. They make sure that with their colleagues, but also with patients and families and communities, they are connecting to find out what is it that this individual or this community needs. We nurses are very pragmatic. Um, when there are problems, uh, it seems like there was no solution. Nurses can always come up with something that nobody else had thought of to solve a particular problem on that day. That can be a problem if we create workarounds to allow systems to not deal with the problems that need to be dealt with. But nurses are very pragmatic. We're very discerning. I've had many situations in my career where I've been in a room full of non-nurses and yet I can read the body language. I know who's 
frustrated. I know who's upset. I know who's tense. Um, and so nurses are very discerning about the human condition. Nurses are able to multitask, and we can do 17 things at once, um, and uh, usually quite effectively. Um, but one other thing that I'd mentioned before is that nurses are sensitive to the human condition. We are present at birth. Nurses are present during painful diagnoses. Nurses are often present at death. So the idea of the human condition and nurses being present at all episodes of meaningful periods in our lives. Now, the nursing workforce demographics are pretty stunning, I think. Uh, and this slide would show that approximately 4.2 million registered nurses are in the United States, but there are 28 million in the world. So it's the largest workforce uh, component anywhere in the world. More than 325,000 licensed nurse practitioners are practicing. There are hundreds of thousands of other advanced practice nurses, like clinical nurse specialists, nurse midwives, nurse anesthetists. The median age of a nurse is 52, which causes some concern because as nurses move toward retirement, we need to make sure that we have a group of nurses coming in that will take their places. But as you can appreciate, the knowledge and skill level of an experienced nurse is greatly different than a beginning practitioner. So the, the brain drain and, and the loss of experience when people are retiring is of great concern, not just to the profession, but really to the healthcare industry. And then finally, the workforce, the nursing workforce is still largely Caucasian and uh, largely female. Now there are many myths about nursing and uh, I wanna cover a few. Um, and the first is that all nurses practice in hospitals. Well, that's not true. About 60% of nurses do practice in hospitals. But as you'll see in just a moment or two, nurses are pretty much anywhere in our society. And I'll cover that in a moment or two. A second myth is that caring for people is the number one requirement. And while caring is a cornerstone of nursing practice and really makes an excellent nurse out of a, a good nurse, uh, caring is not enough. And in fact, many years ago, there was an ad that said, if caring were enough, anyone could be a nurse. And what people don't understand, except nursing students, when they're going through their programs, they're talking with their fellow classmates at our university, and they'll say, I had no idea how rigorous the science background and preparation is, the number of hours of study, the fact that I have to learn hundreds of drugs and, and bacteria. So it's a very rigorous, scientifically based profession. So caring is important, but also scientific knowledge is a cornerstone of nursing practice. A third myth is that uh, nurses are dependent upon physician orders to practice, that we need physician orders to do anything uh, that a nurse does. And while nurses do follow many times physician orders in certain situations, there are a couple of situations where nurses wouldn't follow physician orders. For example, if there is something contraindicated in the order itself. And so physicians and nurses working together want to make sure that, for example, the wrong drug is not ordered. And on occasion that has happened where a physician did not get the information that a patient had an allergy and the nurse spoke up and saved the patient from a serious medical error. So a nurse is not going to blindly follow a physician order if she thinks there's maybe some question about that. The other time uh, where nurses don't have to follow physicians' orders per se, work closely with them, of course, are in many of the states where now nurse practitioners have the freedom to practice without oversight by physicians. It's called independent nursing practice. And just recently passed in the, I believe, 26th state, nurse practitioners are able to practice independently of physician oversight. Similarly, with uh, nurse anesthetists in about 20 states, and this is really important to understand because when you think of some of the rural areas in our state, but possibly in others, uh, there are not physicians in every corner of every state. And so the ability to have really experienced, knowledgeable, educated, advanced practice nurses being able to take care of primary issues that face patients and their families is a very important part of access to health care. So this is much more realistic approach to health care rather than physician dominant and nurses sort of blindly following physician orders. Uh, one related um, uh, perception, this is from a colleague of mine, uh, Mary Chesney at the School of Nursing. And she says the public has this misconception that physicians are apples 
And nurses are slices of the apple, and, and pharmacists are slices of the apple. In other words, a physician is able and knowledgeable and skilled at doing anything in healthcare, regardless of what it is. And nursing has a cutout piece, or pharmacy has a cutout piece. And Mary says, and I totally agree, that is absolutely incorrect. In today's environment, we should really think about physicians, crucially important. They are apples, per se, and nurses are oranges. And the analogy might be a little strained, but the idea being that both have bodies of knowledge, they are crucially important, they have to work together, but one is not a subset of the other, and that's one of the most powerful myths. I've had uh, interviews with uh, business journals, and they'll say, well, why would I need to interview you? Um, because we have a physician that we're talking to. And I always say, well, you know, that is great. That individual will have a wonderful perspective. And also what I will be talking about is that complementary area that I mentioned before about the nursing lens, which is taking a look at the impact of the condition or the disease on the individual, the family, coming up with not just a surgical intervention, for example, but coming up with strategies to help the person meet the goals that they have set for themselves. Now, nursing practice, another myth a, a bit, is that a nurse is a nurse is a nurse, and all of us are equipped to do the same thing. We can do anything, anywhere. Well, no, specialization is really becoming part of nursing. And this very busy slide, I acknowledge, but I could have made it 100 times busier because I wanted to illustrate with this slide some of the different things that nurses do and some of the different places they practice. And again, nurses are everywhere. And so on this slide, upper left is a typical a picture of a nurse, uh, two nurses working together in the intensive care unit. We know that nurses work in the military and they work with children. Flu shots have been given at gas stations. And so you think, how does that fit? Well, it's ease of access to individuals and it encourages them to get their flu shot while they're getting their gas. But this is down from Rochester, Minnesota. And this was an actual picture from a gas station at Rochester, Minnesota. CVS, we know that many nurse practitioners and nurses are working in CVS and Walgreens, again, to provide access to quality health care. Um, on the lower left, there are nursing stations at the Mall of America. So if you are feeling lightheaded or maybe done a little too much shopping or something, but uh, there are nurses at the Mall of America, uh, other kinds of shopping malls. Nurses are there with the homeless. And we often say, how can you give home care to the homeless? But I can assure you that there are nurses working among the homeless and really providing exquisite care. That next woman uh, was the president of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Carol Garrison. So nurses can take senior leadership roles, as true with the woman to her right, who is Regina Cunningham, who is the president and CEO of the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm trying to portray that a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse. And the skill set and the knowledge base that nurses bring equips them to take pretty much any role and do something very positive with it. President is a nurse? Maybe in the future. While the public might have some confusion or believe in some of the myths about nursing, we can also say that the public loves nurses. For more than 20 years, the Gallup organization has conducted a survey asking Americans, who do you think are the most honest and ethical professionals that you are aware of? And so uh, for every year, except one, and I'll talk about that in a second, for every year, nurses have been ranked as either high or very high by a vast majority of the public. This past year, 81% of Americans ranked nurses high or very high in terms of their being honest and ethically practicing. The next group down was the medical physicians, and they were ranked 67% in terms of high or very high uh, in honesty and ethical behavior. Now, interestingly, again, nurses have been number one since the polls began more than 20 years ago, and there was one year that nurses did not rank highest. And that was in 2001 when firefighters were ranked first because of their incredible service during the fall of the Twin Towers in New York City. But every other year, nurses have been number one. At the other end of the scale, it's interesting to note who's at the bottom of the list of rankings as to honest and ethical behavior. At the very bottom of the list, 
chosen as high or very high in terms of honest or ethical behavior were lobbyists. Right behind them were members of Congress who were chosen as practicing high or very high in honesty and ethics by 9% of our population. I'm going to show you just a couple of programs where nurses really use their skills and address the needs of certain populations. This is one, a colleague of mine from Philadelphia, the 11th Street Family Health Service, a very influential program that really is uh, targeted toward helping low-income individuals in North Philadelphia, which is a very challenged area. I lived in Philadelphia for several years. So they provide services, family-oriented scope of services, and they've had wonderful outcomes. You can see the de decrease in preterm births, um, increased immunization rates, and there's a whole slew of other outcomes that they have achieved with this nurse-led family-oriented, community-based health care program. Closer to our home here at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing are nurse practitioner clinics. And I actually participate and get my care at this particular clinic where a group of nurse practitioners, again, in collaboration with physicians, but not under the oversight of physicians, uh, are treating patients for uh, primary health care issues, symptoms, uh, examinations. And so that's a wonderful way, again, ease of access. And, and I choose a nurse practitioner uh, for my care coordination. Another exciting program at the School of Nursing is Prime Time. And this is a program that uh, it's an 18-month youth development program designed to prevent early pregnancy among vulnerable, teen, vulnerable teens. And so they combine one-on-one -on -one case management and peer mentoring, and it's been incredibly effective to reduce the rates of unplanned pregnancy uh, among vulnerable teens. So these are just three examples. There are literally thousands across the country of nurses or nurse practitioners, nurse midwives coming together to offer particular services outside of the scope of the hospital. Now, nursing education, this is a challenge. Uh, and uh, I will explain a little bit about uh, there are some good aspects to it and bad aspects. First thing is that every school of nursing has to be accredited, and there are approximately 1,700 schools of nursing, and many of these schools have many different programs. So nursing uh, schools are the most plentiful in the country compared to medical schools or pharmacy schools. So there are many, many more nursing schools by a multiple of maybe of, of 10 uh, to other healthcare professionals. Um, the individual nurse has to pass what's called the NCLEX exam to begin to practice, and then uh, the nurse can seek additional education, such as I did. I went and got a master's degree uh, at the University of Alabama in Birmingham in taking care of cardiac patients. I then went on for my PhD in nursing economics. So nurses can go on for additional education. They also can uh, become advanced practice nurses, like I had mentioned, as far as getting extra education and certification as a nurse midwife, a nurse practitioner, a nurse anesthetist, or a clinical nurse specialist. And then finally, uh, there are a number of honorific recognitions that nurses can also achieve. So lifelong learning is actually the uh, rule of thumb for most of us in nursing. Uh, not all, but uh, there are pathways that are available. Now, this very busy slide. Uh, I will take a little time. And uh, I have to make the comment, first of all, this is sort of the nursing education landscape. These are the options that nurses or people wanting to be nurses can pursue to become a nurse and then go on in their career if they want. But I want to mention again that that NCLEX, that square box at the top and the center, that's the licensing examination that anybody who wants to practice nursing has to pass. Now, the thing that's unique almost about nursing is that you'll see a lot of circles in one box off to the left. And what those reflect is the reality, which is a good thing and a challenging thing, which I'll talk about in a second, the reality of the options that individuals have to pursue a path to sit for the licensing examination. Most of the other health professions like medicine and pharmacy and occupational therapy have one pretty defined path. And because nursing has been around for ages, several different options have emerged that uh, provide some latitude for individuals to choose different paths, but do pose some confusion when we talk about nursing education. This slide, you can see, is not a tidy linear slide. 
it offers options, but it's kind of confusing. So let me just take a minute or two to explain this because it's really important, particularly for those of you who might be associated with a school of nursing or a university to understand all the different variations. Because again, a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse, nor is a nursing program, a nursing program, a nursing program. So the upper left circle is associate degree programs, and those are usually based in community colleges. They are two years in length for the most part. If you go part-time, however, it can take three or four years. And so if somebody wants to 100% go to school, this is the fastest way to become a nurse, an associate degree program. However, you'll see that it doesn't really enable you to quickly access any of these other roles that you might want to pursue, like nurse practitioner or uh, many leadership roles. But if a person just wants to have a nursing degree and practice at the bedside or in clinics, this is an option that they might choose. The second circle, called diploma, is really the historical antecedent of much of the nursing workforce in our country. Not so much other countries, but these are uh, programs that were based in hospitals. They're usually three years in length. This is where many nurses who are now getting it toward retirement age became a nurse through a diploma program. The individual would often live in a school of nursing. They would uh, work 10, 12 hours in the hospital, just walk down the corridor and go to the hospital and practice. Um, but again, it doesn't allow access to these other roles that the person might want to to achieve. And actually, if somebody wanted to even go back to school, uh, a lot of the credits that are that are generated in these hospital-based programs don't transfer into most universities. So again, it's a way to three years solid training, uh, and uh, it enables uh, students to become a nurse in three years, but it doesn't offer a lot of latitude. The third uh, circle is the BSN, and that's the bachelor's of science in nursing degree. And this is a baccalaureate degree, uh, and this is what is offered usually in university settings. Uh, it's for the most part a four, a four and a half year degree. It's often uh, begun uh, one or two years in terms of general courses like chemistry and physics and, and those kinds of courses. And then two or three years, the last two or three years are nursing courses where people learn to uh, provide care to patients. They learn about leadership. They learn about uh, a number of things that they're going to be, have to be able to do when they practice. So the Bachelor's of Science in Nursing is almost the fundamental uh, degree, the cornerstone. And it's one that national organizations such as the National Academy of Medicine has said, our country, because it requires this knowledge, not just hands-on, but we should strive to achieve 80% of nurses having a baccalaureate degree. And we are not at that goal yet, but that's a national goal that we would achieve. 80% of our nurses are prepared as a basic level at the baccalaureate degree. Then you see a box on the lower left-hand side, and that is that sometimes people come uh, with other degrees. Maybe I've got a... Uh, a baccalaureate in anatomy or in chemistry, and I, I want to become a nurse. And so what the nursing profession has uh, offered these people are a couple of options where you can either take your baccalaureate and add maybe 18 months of intensive nursing, and then you end up with either a baccalaureate or, as in the case at the University of Minnesota, you end up with a master's degree because the thought is you already have a well-qualified baccalaureate degree, we're going to give you intensive 18 months of nursing, and then when you are done, you can sit for the NCLEX, and you will end up with a professional master's in nursing. So these are all of the kinds of ways that individuals can move to sit for the NCLEX. And then the pictures on the right, I won't go into those in detail, but those are some of the options that nurses then get can then pursue if they have been able to be uh, matriculated into a baccalaureate program and or then a master's or even a PhD such as I have. So there are a lot of opportunities for nurses uh, in terms of getting sitting for the boards and then expanding their career later on. As I mentioned, it's a very busy slide and sometimes people have said, why don't we just have one pathway? Well, again, there are pros and cons. Now, I want to talk just a few minutes about nursing research because people are often very mystified about, do nurses do research? 
And it's like, yes, nurses do research. And the kinds of things that nurses do research on are about the health and promotion um, over the lifespan, the care of people with health problems, uh, enhancing ability of individuals to take care of themselves, uh, looking at ways that the organization, this is the focus of my PhD, looking at ways that an organization can really help in the delivery of health care or um, kind of impede the delivery of health care. And nurses also do uh, research on how do we help nursing students really have an optimal experience. So next slide uh, shows that uh, there are a couple of ways, a uh, couple of approaches that uh, people can do research. Um, for example, improving health outcomes in adults newly diagnosed with diabetes. Pain assessment on cognitively impaired elders. Development of a tool to measure children's satisfaction. That particular study was done here at the University of Minnesota several years ago by uh, two colleagues, uh, one from the University Hospital and uh, Dr. Linda Lindicky from our School of Nursing, and they wanted to explore children's satisfaction, and it had never been done any place else in the country because people would ask the parents, how is your child experiencing the hospital stay? And so they were the first in the country to ask the children directly, how is this working or not working for, for you? But you can see it really focuses on the person and takes a wide-angled lens at the experience of the hospital stay, not just was the child improving after surgery. A couple of other examples, fatigue in women undergoing cancer treatment. This next one is actually one of my favorite studies that has been done at the School of Nursing. It was part of a a, a grouping of projects uh, that the Densford Center at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing sponsored several years ago. But it shows the approach that a physician might take uh, to research and a nurse might take. And the title is Upper Extremity Aerobic Training for Critical Limb Ischemia. And, and basically what that means is, does upper body motion, like on a machine, improve lower body functioning and reduce the pain. And the reason why this is so important, and the woman who studied this, Dr. Diane Treat Jacobson, she was a nurse who emphasized and focused on peripheral vascular disease, where people have difficulty walking, they have pain, pain walking, which then makes them walk less, and so it's just a very vicious cycle. And she had done a lot of care of these patients to try to help them alleviate their pain. She read about this study that occurred in Sweden and so she read about this and thought, I want to try this with my patients who have peripheral vascular disease. Because the treatment at the time was once a patient got to a certain level of functioning, they would have to have an amputation. And so that would be the normal course that the physician and the surgeons would take, that they, they try to prevent this, but at some point it got so intractable that they would have to do amputation. And Diane changed the question. And so instead of saying, how can we do better care for people who have had an amputation, what Diane did was change the focus of the surgery, focus of the research to say, how can we prevent the need for amputation at all? And so she thought, let's try this upper body, almost bicycling effect and see the impact on lower body functioning. And it worked. And so she was able by this research and to get national funding to change the way we treat people with peripheral vascular disease in these areas. So to me, it's just brilliant research, but it also shows the different way that a nurse might approach the research question about quality of life and how to help people even prevent terrible situations. But that really embodies, to me, nursing research. So there are many... Uh, challenges today in healthcare. Uh, and I, as I said, I've been a nurse for, for decades. And so it's tremendously challenging, healthcare itself. And when you look at the intersection of healthcare and higher education and nursing in our society today, the challenges that each of these components are facing, it really is daunting. COVID has ex exposed a number of uh, system issues that we're trying to get around as far as enough supplies, uh, the coordination, the infection control, uh, a lot of the issues. Uh, we had to isolate patients so that they couldn't be seen by their families, and that created an incredible sense of isolation. Um, and so COVID has just really added a whole level of complexity. 
One in 10 nurses report feeling worthless. And more than one in two nurses reports feeling emotionally unhealthy. And it's not surprising. I, I wonder uh, how nurses can do it today. And I thought things were challenging when I was practicing at the bedside, but it is incredibly challenging, very stressful. 85% of nurses, however, say they would choose their career again. So I think the challenges are for us in any of our other roles that are either supporting a nursing program or collaborating with or partnering is to see how can we lighten the load, not just for the nursing staff, but any of the healthcare providers that are in the space. How can we change our policies, our practices, our organizational regulations? How can we have the environment be more welcoming and supportive, both for patients, families, and nurses. So incredibly challenging time, uh, much more that we could go into depth in that area, but on the one hand, incredibly rewarding career. And I'll close with my most favorite quote of nursing. Um, nursing puts us in touch with being human. Without even asking, we are invited into the inner spaces of other people's existence. For where there was loneliness, suffering, the tolerable pain of cure, or the solitary pain of permanent change, there is a need for the kind of human service we call nursing. Thank you.